Father, you said, feed my sheep, and I will. But give me the food. I'm here to feed your sheep. These are your sheep. They're not mine, they're yours. Give me the food to feed them so they will be forever changed here today, now. May your sheep be fed. May your sheep be nourished. May your sheep be transformed into everything you want them to be. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to preach, talk. I'm not sure what I'm doing, James. A message entitled, I Want My Innocence Back. Chapter 3, verses 6 through 7. We're familiar with the story of the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in verse number 7, it says that the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked. Now, I'm not going to get into the deepest parts of the theology to explain all that means, but I do want to touch on something very important about that topic. What does it mean they knew they were naked? How did they not know they were naked before? Once they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what happened that so changed them. And some would say, well, they were clothed with the glory of God or, or you know, they, they, they had some kind of um, adornment upon them from the Lord himself. That being aside, what does it mean they knew they were naked? Listen closely. It means their motives were no longer pure. They lost or at least gave up their innocence. So now, they viewed and considered and contemplated and reasoned and judged everything through jaded motives, through impure intentions. through ideas that no longer were innocent or pure. It changed their motives for selfish reasoning. It's kind of like walking behind a group of people and all of a sudden a $100 bill falls on the ground in front of you. Now a pure motive picks it up and says, hey, somebody drops this. An impure motive says, well, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away and he giveth right now. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Everything they thought, every intention they had, if you have absolutely zero impure intentions and are completely innocent, you don't look at anything with the potential that evil could be contemplated. It couldn't even be thought. And that moment they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, all that impurity was gone. And selfishness entered. Impure motives, impure thoughts, innocence lost. They hid from God. Listen, they hid from God because innocence was lost. They hid from the Lord because innocence was lost. Impurity had entered, was introduced to their intentions. And so when the Lord entered the garden, and listen, they were familiar with him because not only they didn't hear his voice, they heard his steps. Never before would they have hidden from God. But at that moment, they hid from God because now their intentions were impure. They had lost their innocence. So at the footsteps of the Holy One walking through the garden, they became afraid. Can I tell you something that I can't prove theologically, but I believe with all my heart it's true, and you can throw it out if you want to. I believe it was Jesus. When you look through Scripture, you will see Jesus in every... 
Jacob asked, give me your name. He wouldn't give him his name. Why? Because it wasn't time for Yeshua to be introduced to the world, God incarnate. But the Lord showed up many times. You see him all the time. Who was Melchizedek? You see it through Scripture, right? And so the Lord saw their condition. He saw they had lost their innocence. And now they viewed everything through tainted, jaded eyes and impure hearts and lost innocence. So what did the Lord do? He killed an animal to cover them. To cover them. Just take her to the back, brother. Now, some, and we cannot prove this theologically, some believe that it was a lamb that he killed. I don't know. I wasn't there. But if it was, either way, here is the lamb killing a lamb who would one day sacrifice himself as a lamb for you and me. What an amazing thing. I'm going to take care of you. And so the Lord bends down. Can you imagine that moment? Here's the Lord taking his creation and slaying it in front of them and bleeding it and skinning it and cleaning it to cover them. Adam and Eve walked out of the garden forgiven, but not innocent. Jesus came as a greater sacrifice, church, to not just forgive sins, but restore innocence and purity. When you often say, Lord, what are you doing to me? Once you receive Jesus, you go, we are in a bathing process where he is cleaning the most innermost parts of our being, preparing us for that day. That's what Jesus does. He saves us, redeems us, forgives us, and then miraculously, he goes to work on us, making our intentions, our motives pure. I hate that my intentions are always pure. Do you hate that about yourself? The Lord makes us immortal. And then he goes to work to cause our immortality to be pure. See, was that not the problem with Adam and Eve? They were immortal, but the moment they failed, they were immortal, an everlasting being, doomed, So the Lord saves us so we can be everlasting in heaven, but yet they were impure. And so Jesus does a greater work. He doesn't want to cover it. He wants to wash it out. Jesus restores innocence. And if we are not as innocent as we want to be, we are more innocent, I hope, as you walk with Christ than you used to be. But can I just say this? Whatever you've done, wherever you've been, whatever sins you've committed, whatever atrocities against the nature, the ordinances of God Almighty himself, you were not pure before you committed those things either. You were the seed of the first Adam but the Lord desires to make you pure. Would you open your Bibles to Mark chapter number one? Let's look here this morning. Let's jump down to verse number 40. And it says, Now a leper came to Jesus, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you are Willing, you can make me clean. Say clean. The 
Then Jesus moved with compassion towards this leper, stretched out his hand, and he touched him and said to him, I am willing, be, say it, cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately a leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he strictly, Jesus did, warned him and sent him away at once and said, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. He basically had to go to the temple and get a certificate that he was no longer a leper, a certificate that he had been cleansed, a declaration cleansing. Why did the leper ask to be cleansed and not healed? He asked to be cleansed, not healed. Because as a leper, you could not live among the other people of God. As a leper, you could not go to the temple. As a leper, you could not come near the presence of God. As a leper, you could not do the things of God, participate in the festivities of God. You could not participate in the worship of God. You were held at a distance because you were a leper. And so when he asked the Lord to make him clean, he was basically saying, I want to draw near to you. I'm going to dwell among the people of God, among the things of God, among you, Lord. I want to come close to you. I'm held at bay. Come on. Who in this room has not felt like a leper before where well, you're kept an arm's distance from the things of God? You're just different. He wasn't necessarily guilty of any sin. Come on. You're not in sin anymore. Maybe you're not doing those things that have made you feel unclean or caused people to label you unclean. But you feel like a leper. You're not guilty of any current sin that you used to do that made you feel unclean in the first place. But the stigma, the stain of it, still is worn upon the fabric of your soul. You feel like people are talking about it when they're not even saying it out loud. You feel like people are thinking it when no one is saying it. You feel it about yourself when you come into the presence of God. A leper was kept. They had leper colonies where you had to stay. You had to stay at a distance. This man took courage to even approach Jesus, and Jesus broke the law by touching him. And then Jesus, in the place of the highest of high priests, said what? You were cleansed. He declared him clean. When Jesus said, be cleansed, be made clean, that word, katharizo, from the original text means to make clean, purify, to clean from stains and dirt, consecration of purity. Who would like to hear Jesus say that over you today? Who doesn't want to be clean before the Lord? It is more than forgiveness. It is more than healing. It is a restoration of innocence and purity. And let me tell you something today. Jesus can make you pure. Jesus can make you innocent. 
What does the scripture tell us? What the Lord has cleansed, let no man call common and or unclean. We read this all the time. Let's go to 1 John. We read this all the time, but I want us to pay careful attention Though we've talked about this recently. This is the thing the Lord has put on my heart for us. 1 John chapter number 1. Verse number 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. That basically means you got to agree with God. And continues in verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And to what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Are you ready for this? The same word he used when he told the leper, you were cleansed, Gatherizzo, is the same word used here. Do you see the marriage between forgiveness and cleansing? So what the Lord is saying here is not only will I forgive you, but I will cleanse you of all unrighteousness, of all the stains, of all the impurity. I will not only restore, but even to a higher level, I will create a greater innocence than that which you since you lost. Jesus did not just forgive you when you come to him seeking it. He cleanses you, puts you in a place of innocence and purity. Jesus leaves you better than you were before you did what you did. And if you don't believe that, you underestimate the power of God. You need a divine visitation. Before you did the things you did, if Jesus gets a hold of you and calls you cleansed, you're cleaner than you were before you did the things you did. And I don't care what the polls about you say. I don't care what your family says. I don't care what your former relations say. I don't care what your own mind says. If the Lord says you're cleansed, who's going to argue with Jesus? Last time I checked, everybody loses that argument. And we got some pretty good arguers in here. Now grasp this and hear this closely. We were dirty before we ever sinned in the way that made us feel like we're unclean. Our sin simply reveals our need to come to Jesus for cleansing. Who in this room has not thought at some point of your life that you were better than you really are? And then when you fell, you realized you weren't that good, but you weren't that good before you fell. You just tricked yourself into thinking you were. But now there's this honest relationship you got going on with Jesus because you know you were as messed up as he knew you were before you knew you were, and now you can say, Lord, I didn't know, and he says, clean. See, he didn't come just to forgive you. He came to cleanse you because Adam and Eve walked out of that garden forgiven because he shed blood, covered that sin. But the reality was when they walked out, they still weren't innocents. And he wants to purify your motives and your intentions. And part of that is coming for cleansing. And sometimes before we even do those things that reveal that we need cleansing.
There are times in our life that it reveals to us that we need to come to God for purifying. Hear this. His cleansing actually gives you innocence you didn't have before you realized you had done something wrong. You had leprosy the whole time. It was just hidden under the covering of your skin. It was hidden in the deep places of your being. It was always there. You were always a rascal. It's just certain conditions took place and caused it to come out. Isn't it funny? We think people are ourselves, right? We're only sinners as much as people know we're sinners. But it's not how people perceive you or think of you. It's how God perceives you. It's what God sees. And so some people are really good at hiding their sin. I feel sorry for those people. That all their sin is hidden under the covering of their skin, but it's there. We need cleansing even before, oh Lord, cleanse me. Jesus told the woman caught in adultery, I don't condemn you. You're forgiven, right? That's what he's basically saying. You're forgiven. Today's your lucky day. You don't get to catch a boulder to the face. That's pretty good. I mean, in my book, rock to the face or no rock to the face. I'm taking no rock to the face. You're forgiven. And then he said something very important. Go and sin no more. Why would he say that? Not just because he didn't want her to take her forgiveness and spend it foolishly, but he was saying it because you're not her anymore. You're forgiven. Go and sin no more. You were an adulteress. You're not an adulteress now. Don't do that because that's not who I've made you today in this moment. People often wonder what Jesus was writing on the ground, and some people thought, well, he's writing in, you know, words of love. I don't know. Maybe he was playing hangman. I don't know. I wasn't there. I often think that he was writing the sins of other people in the crowd and writing arrows to them, but that's the way. I can't theologically say that's true, but trust me, he knows your sin before your sin finds you out. And he told her, go and sin no more. Why? Because you were not that woman who was thrown in the dirt before me, caught in the very act. I've forgiven you, and when I forgive you, I cleanse you, so do not return to that life. Don't become that again, because that's not what you are anymore. You are cleansed. Those hidden mo motives within us. When he cleanses them, we are cleaner than we were before. Why does a sinner, a leper, need to know they're cleansed? I'm going to say it again. Why does a leper, a sinner, need to know they are cleansed? Because a forgiven leper returns back to the leper colony. A forgiven sinner returns back to sin. But a cleansed leper does not go back to the colony they were in before. A cleansed sinner does not return to the colony that they've been cleansed from. 
they go on to a different life. And I think sometimes we are living like forgiven lepers and we return to the same thing, not realizing that's not who we are. When he forgave me, he cleansed me. I'm not who I was. And the Lord doesn't need a poll in your community or neighborhood to declare that. If he says you're clean, you're clean. Don't go back to the same colony you were in before. How many of you all have work clothes or clothes that's got paint on them and tears in them? It's, it's the, the clothes that you do the junk in. The stuff. Cleaning out the gutters, hosing off the patio. Cleaning the house up, handling garbage. Painting rooms. You got those clothes, right? I mean, you've had them since 1936. I mean, they're hanging off of you. They look... I mean, when you put those clothes on, you don't care what you do because you don't care about the clothes you're wearing. But if you put on clean clothes, you're more cautious because you understand the value of what you've got on. Do you see why it's important you know you're cleansed? You're not wearing what you were wearing. You are not who you used to be. And we need to walk in a different way and live in a different colony with a different heart and different motives and different intentions. Let the Lord purify those things in you. We need to know Jesus has cleansed us. Not so we can have a good reputation among our fellow citizens or fellow church members or neighborhood or Yelp. Or so we won't get unfacebooked on Facebook. We don't need a good reputation among people. That would be nice. Some people will never give you that. I want to know, has the Lord cleansed you? He declares us cleansed so we can go on living for God unchained by the things that used to chain us, unhindered by the things that used to hinder us. Because if we think we're still tethered to it, we're going to go back to it. I know we've got animal lovers in here, and I am too. I've got four children, so I love animals. And some people don't like dogs on leashes, but when I was growing up, everybody had a dog, and every dog was on a leash. Now we go to restaurants, they put their dog on the table while I'm about to eat. I don't get it. Wash your hands, wear a mask, but go ahead and put the dog on the table. I don't care. I think it's funny. Sometimes little dogs run to me. And they jump up next to me. I try to act tough because I don't want people to know that I'm partial to little animals because it will ruin my reputation. But have you ever seen these dogs or big dogs, little dogs on a leash? And when somebody walks by, that dog says, I'm going to go get them and I'm going to do what God created me to do. I'm going to bite them. Right? And sometimes I have the same feeling about people. And that dog takes off, forgetting that they're leashed. And they get to the end of that leash. And what happens? Even the big dogs let out little chihuahua squeals. Ay! I often think that's like us. We're tethered, and when we go to run for Jesus, we go to do something for God, we go to go on for the Lord, suddenly there's a leash that jerks us back because we feel uncleansed, unclean. I feel like the body of Christ in general is that way. Shame hinders us from going more deeply into God's presence and it keeps pulling you back into the doghouse of your past. If you don't recognize you're not just forgiven, but you are cleansed, you will not go on to the deeper things of God. Something will always stop you. Go back to 1 John, if you will, please. Let's look here. 
again, because I want you to see something, because so often we go to these scriptures, and as we look at them, we fail to see all of it, and we mention part of it, but I'm not sure if you've ever seen this, and I'm sure you have, but maybe you've skipped over it. Let's go to verse number 6, 1 John chapter 1. Now, we just read below, right, what? That if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and what? Well, that was wonderful. Some of y'all need to get the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. He's faithful and just to what? Forgive us and cleanse us. So let, let's jump up here to verse number 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him, Jesus, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You can't walk in the light if you were still tethered to your past. You will always be submitted to the darkness of your reputation or those things you have done. You will be locked in impurity and a lack of innocence. So what? how do we become clean by walking in his light? He cleanses us, and when he cleanses us, what do we do? We walk in it. We walk in it. We walk in it. We walk in his presence. We walk in his light. We walk in his truth. But some of us have been called cleansed, but we're still dwelling in darkness. Because the enemy has you convinced, why go on? Why do this? I've blown it. And how many of you know, you never pick up where you started. You pick up where you left off and you end up in a worse condition. Go and sin no more. That is not who you are anymore. I've called you clean. I haven't just forgiven you. I haven't just avoided the judgment that comes with that, but I've eliminated the impurity and I'm restoring innocence. And the more you walk in that light, the more innocent and pure all those things become. If anybody would ever walk in it long enough, we could finally maybe become partly the people God needs and wants us to be. My wife won't admit it, but it's on her resume, even though she doesn't put it when she puts it on a job application, but she used to work at Subway. And she will tell you that after a day at Subway, she came home and the whole house would smell like Subway bread. And maybe you like Subway bread, maybe you don't, but I'm sure if you worked there, you wouldn't. Because the longer you sit in anything, the more you begin to smell like it. And if you're not sitting in Jesus, if you're not sitting with the Lord, you do not have his fragrance. But the longer you sit with him, the longer you walk with him, the longer you're in the light, suddenly it has, begins to have an impact, not just on the external, friend, but it starts to have an impact on the internal. It starts to change who you are. And you can only do that if you're in the light. We've got to get in the light. This has got to quit being a Sunday thing. You've got to carry the presence in with you and carry the presence out with you. You can't just turn the switch on and turn the switch off. You've got to have the switch with you all the time. Walk in the light. Walk in the light. The longer you let the devil keep telling you that you're not clean, you know what you're going to do? You're going to stay in darkness. So you've got to make a decision today. We're going to take communion in a little bit. And we're going to take communion so you will be cleansed. And you're going to walk out of here cleansed because Jesus says you're clean. Not because I say it or they say it or the upcoming poll says it, but because Jesus has said it, he has declared it, you are clean. He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, not some of it, but all of it. Shame and guilt keeps us in the dark. It keeps us in the dark. It keeps us out of God's presence. God's presence is cleansing. God's presence is purifying. And the more you're in his presence, the purer and the more clean we become. It's his presence that does it. 
And so the enemy will do anything he can to keep you out of God's presence. If it's a flat tire, if it's a rainy day, if it's an argument with someone in your home, just keep you out of presence, not only here, but in your private prayer life. Because if he can keep you out of God's presence, he can keep you from getting those inner parts washed in his presence because in his presence, we are washed. He wants to keep you in the dark. Do you see that? That's why you lay in the bed thinking, oh, God, I can't believe what I've done. Oh, God, I'm dirty. Oh, God, I'm unclean. Oh, God, I'm a horrible person. That shame and guilt keeps coming. When people tell me, I said, well, when's the last time you did it? has been six years. Six years since you've lived that life? You're clean, man. But if the devil does that, remember the sinful woman that washed the feet of Christ with the tears of her eyes and wiped them with the hair of her head and broke the alabaster box over his feet? Do you remember that? Do you know where that was? That was inside a Pharisee's house. That was inside the religious people's home. Who said, this is a sinful woman. If he were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is, but he knew exactly what kind of woman he was because he had forgiven, cleansed her earlier. Are you listening? Now, had she not believed she was cleansed, she would have hung outside that door in the dark of night looking in the window. Gosh, I wish I could go in. Gosh, I wish I could touch Jesus. Gosh, I wish I could be in his presence. Gosh, I wish he loved me. Gosh, I wish I could be cleansed. Gosh, I wish I could be near him. But she did not stay in the dark. She didn't peek through the door, but she walked in with boldness. Why? Because she was not who she was. She knelt at his feet, wept over them, wiped them with the hair of her head, broke the alabaster block. Why? Because she knew she was cleansed. Because she took his word for it. She was marred by the whole town. Everybody knew what kind of a woman she was. But it doesn't care if people know what kind of a man or a woman you are. It's what kind of a man or a woman Jesus has called you. And you should walk in that cleanliness. You should walk in that cleansing. You should walk it out in power, in a demonstration. We're humble about it because none of us could be clean without him. Only he makes us clean. I want to save time for the end, but in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse number 5, the prophet Isaiah finds himself in the presence of the Lord Almighty. A seraphim, and the Lord is there. As he comes in the presence of God, what does he say? Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. Woe is me, I am done, done. I am undone in your presence. Now listen closely. Who was this man? He was a prophet sent with a message to Israel, to God's people, ordained by God to do it. And it says that the seraphim took a coal from the altar and touched his lips. And when he touched his lips, he took that coal from the altar. He touched his lips. He was forgiven and made clean. It literally uses the word purged, and purge means to cleanse. He cleansed him. What did he do? He made made him innocent. All of our fake innocence will melt away when you come into God's presence because he sees the deepest parts of our hearts. And why is that important for us to know? This was not a wicked man that went into God's presence. It was a righteous man that went into God's presence, at least in the eyes of the world, in a lot of ways in the eyes of God. But even when a good person or a good man or a good woman or a righteous man or a righteous woman comes in the presence of God compared to him, you are undone. And unless he touches you and purifies you, you'll never be pure because we're all unclean in the presence of God. It's he that makes us pure. Cleansing is not something we do, it's something Jesus does. You understand that, right? But we we must come for cleansing. You've got to let him do it. The Lord wanted to wash the disciples' feet, and Peter said, No, you're not touching my feet. It's been six years since I've had a pedicure, Lord. I got pterodactyl toes. No. In his false humility, he said, no, don't touch my feet. I'm not worthy. And he said, if I don't clean you, then you have no part with me. And he said, Lord, not my feet also, my head, my hands, everything. He said, calm down, Peter. Your feet's enough. I'm not doing all of it right now. (laughs) 
we have to be willing to let the Lord cleanse us. The seraphim that flew in the very presence of Almighty God. How many wings do they have? Six wings. With two, they did what? Covered their feet. With two, they covered their face. And with two, they flew. You ever wonder why are they covering their face and why are they covering their feet? Because even a perfectly created creature in the presence of God is unclean next to a holy, mighty God. I can't even look upon him. See, you were unclean before you did what you did. The Lord can make you innocent again. He can make you pure because it's him that makes even those that think they're clean pure. Do you believe Jesus can do that? Jesus bore our guilt and he bore our shame. Let's specify. He bore your guilt and he bore your shame. Jesus was made unclean so you could be made clean. Brand new. Better than before. Jesus did not fix your torn, tattered, stained, and filthy robe. He gave you a new one. That means in whatever condition you come into the Lord, you need his cleansing. Oh, Lord, clean me. Because anything that we've done that's displeased the Lord or anything that you will ever, God forbid, do that displeases the Lord was not a sin of the hands, it was a sin of the heart. And no one can touch that but Jesus. No one can cleanse that but Jesus. We need a purging. But that only happens when we come into his presence. Clean me, Lord. And if he's called you clean, you're clean in that way. And if he's forgiven you that thing, you're forgiven of that thing. Be ye cleansed. Jesus always does that. He makes it better than before. He doesn't want to give you old life back. Who in this room has not said, Lord, I want my old life back. Lift your hand, be honest before the Lord. Look at you. Lord, I want things to be the way they used to be. Come on, anybody? No, you don't. And the Lord doesn't either. He wants to be better than it used to be, better than it was. He doesn't come to make you a better creation. He comes to make you a new creation, a new creature. He doesn't come to make old things kind of better. He comes to make old things new. Jesus doesn't tape anything back together. He recreates it. He's a creator. I'm constantly asking the Lord to change my heart. Give me a new heart, Lord. Make my heart new. Make my heart more like you. Make my mind new. Let that mind that is in Christ be in me, O Lord. I don't want this one fixed. I want a brand new one. The Samaritans, the scripture says a lot about Samaritans. There's Samaritans are mentioned several times, and there's two prominent places that we can go right to just off the top of our head. Most of us, anyhow, we go right to the Samaritan woman at the, at the well talking to Jesus, right? We go right to the good Samaritan, right, who helped the man on the side of the road, that, that religion and, and, and politics and, and humanity's best walked by. And why did they walk by? Because they really couldn't do anything anyhow. Nobody can fix your problem but Jesus. Listen close to what I'm going to tell you right now. See, the Samaritans were a people who basically were in Israel when the Assyrians came and took it over. And they're under the heading of their captors, the Jew intermingled with the Assyrians. And what was birthed out of that was the Samaritans. And so hear this, and, and, I, and I pray you can get this and, and understand it completely. They were basically half-breeds to everybody, always impure, forever. The world wouldn't accept me because I'm part Jewish. And the Jews wouldn't accept me because of my past, or you can't help how you're born, my lineage, 
I wasn't completely Jewish. So you're not completely worldly and you're not completely Jewish. You're not completely Jewish and you're not completely worldly. It describes a lot of you. So you've come out of the world, but you're not of the world. And so they weren't accepted in any circles in the world, so they were, they were shunned and actually had to stick together because no, the world didn't want them because you're not worldly enough and the Jews didn't want them. You're not Jewish enough. Come on. You weren't raised like us. You weren't raised with a communion cup in your hand. You don't say amen at the right time. You don't even tilt your head the right way when we say hallelujah. It's like this, brother. You got no spirit fingers. You got no spirit feet. Your Bible's not worn and torn yet. The world says you're just not worldly enough. Man, every time you're just, you're just a buzzkill. Come on. Oh, Lord, that you were. God bless you if you are. Because you're just not worldly enough. It's a spiritual dilemma. It's like being forgiven but still ashamed. And we kind of live in this defeated victory. I said we live in this defeated victory. Victoriously, victoriously defeated. Right? Your whole life is nothing but a participation trophy. I'm here, but I didn't do anything. Because you won't believe what Jesus said. You're cleansed. You're cleansed. You know what you've done? You're not what they did. You are who God has said. And if he says cleansed, then you're cleansed. And if you're cleansed, then you should live like it. Because the cleansed speak differently. They think differently. They're changing. We are in the process of being changed. Anybody? The good Samaritan, obviously, in some ways, in the biggest way, represents Jesus. He was the rejected one. He was the half-breed, so to speak. He wasn't Jewish enough, wasn't worldly enough. But yet he's the one that steps in. They're all rejecting me, but I'm the one that's going to save you. But in a lot of ways, also what? He's exemplifying and telling us we should be that way. What is he saying? Just because you're marked by the church and they won't accept you, and marked by the world because they don't totally accept you, I want you to know you're cleansed and you can still be redeemers for the kingdom of heaven and honor Jesus. And oftentimes you can do the most if you just accept the cleansing because Samaritans can be made pure. We all come out of the womb, sinners. I told you I worked with a man by the name of, well, I'm not going to say his name. He's deceased, so I'm not going to say it. He was a great guy. But I can remember what I would say things to him. He'd say, I'm as pure as the driven snow. I think I told you before, he was from the Bronx, if I remember. I'm like, brother, I've seen the snow in Bronx, and it's not pure. <laughs> Doesn't even look like snow. It looks like mush, brown, dirty mush. It looks horrible, dirty None of us were born pure. You were born fallen. You were born decrepit creation in need of God. None of us is born. None of us come out of the womb. We all come out sinners. You were never innocent. Even before you knew you weren't innocent. Did you catch that? You always needed cleansing. You were never pure. It's just your impurity revealed that you were impure, and so good news, now you can come for cleansing. We don't relish in the things we've done, but we need to come for cleansing. All of us, the good and the bad. We got an old preacher friend who, who has said before, he said, listen, and he stood up and he said, I know. He said, I've, I've never slept with another woman other than my wife. I've never had sex before marriage. I've never done drugs, never been high. I've never been drunk. I've never stolen anything. But the moment I came to Jesus, I knew I was a sinner, decrepit, lost, and in need of God. I was wicked and I saw it. Even the best of it. We need Jesus. We need cleansing. We all came out of the womb spiritual lepers. The only way we were ever innocent or pure is if Jesus declares us innocent and pure. And today he's going to do that. And you are going to be unleashed, untethered, unbound, unhindered. And you're going to walk in the light. And he is going to 
purify your motives and your intentions and things are going to change. Can you receive that today? To be forgiven and not know you were cleansed or receive cleansing is kind of like being released from prison and keeping the prison garments on. It's like being let out, but still having your numbers on. And I find a lot of us as believers, we live that way. I'm forgiven. But we haven't come for cleansing and we're not letting him cleanse us and we're not walking in cleansing and we're staying in the dark even though he's called us clean. The charges don't exist anymore. Did you hear me? People still see you a certain way. The enemy will use that. With Jesus, you've not just been released, but the records were removed. It's like you never, ever did it because he cleanses. Forgiveness is you did your time, you're let out. Cleansing is your record's gone. It's forgotten. It exists no more. Peter and Paul were not always Peter and Paul. Did you hear me? They had different names. They were different people. Simon and Saul were no longer Simon and Saul. Not only did he forgive them, but he gave them a new identity. Jesus can do that, not just in verbiage, but in reality. But it's important we walk in that newness. See, when the Lord told Satan, get behind me, when he told Peter to get behind him, he was telling Simon to get behind him because that was the old way of thinking and being. And sometimes we will go and drift back. The Lord says, uh-uh, I've cleansed you. Remember who I've called you and what you are. Come on up, Dante. God has the power to change. Jesus has the power to change hearts and motives. In fact, you know the Bible tells us that Jesus is going to have a new name in heaven? Did you know that? Name written, right? On his, no one knew. No one knew. What does that mean? That means there's a, a, a specific name for the Lord in heaven that no one on the world will ever know, but those that are his will know there. And it would not surprise me if we've all got different names. And they speak Spanish in heaven. I, I'm, <laughs> if they do, I'm glad they're changing their mind because I don't like Timoteo. <laughs> Sounds like something on a Mexican menu, and I don't like it. I used to hate in Spanish class. They say, Timoteo. I'm like, what is this? What is this? Like, I don't know what our names are going to be, but the Lord is into changing names because he knows once he gets a hold of you, you are not what you were. A brief story I want to tell you about a, a lady by the name of Mrs. Rathenau. And Mrs. Rathenau was a woman who lived in Germany in the 1920s. Mrs. Rathenau was married to a Jewish man. And sadly... Her husband, who happened to be the finance minister of Germany in the 20s, an anti-Semite killed him for no reason other than that he was Jewish. He just saw him and he had the right and he killed him and murdered him. The mother of the murderer was in desperation over the crime her son had committed and she could not believe he had done such a thing. Mrs. Rathenau, the wife of the victim, was a Christian she had been forgiven and cleansed. 
And she went to the mother to comfort her and to love her and to encourage her in the faith. And then at the beckoning of the Lord, you know what she did? She went to the prison and visited the man that killed her husband and led him to Jesus Christ. But the story doesn't stop there. Because at a later time, he's released from prison, and this same man who had murdered, many years later, he was put in a high command in the German military during their occupation of France. And during the occupation of France, this same man who had murdered a man because he was Jewish secretly released multitudes of Jews and did the opposite. And not only did that happen, not only did he release many that he'd killed before, he got caught for it and was executed for being both one that would release God's people and a believer in Jesus Christ. And what is the point? He was cleansed, and not only did he believe it, he walked it out and lived like it and did things differently than he used to do. But we can't do things differently than we used to do until we come to the acceptance and the belief that what Jesus says is real and his power is powerful enough even to cleanse someone like me. I never deserved his cleansing, and I never will. But at moments in my life, I now know I need it. Do you need his cleansing? Stand to your feet, please. I'm going to open this altar right now. And if you need to give your life to Jesus, as a prodigal son or daughter who is strayed. You're sitting in here, but you know that you're not right with God and you're running from him. Come to this altar. If you're a backslider and you need to have that condition that has separated you from God, come to this altar. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, maybe you've been in church You've heard me say it a million times, going to church doesn't make you a Christian just like walking through a car wash doesn't make you a car. You have to let Jesus in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. See, right now he's knocking. Now you can cling to your old life all you want. You can cling to the past all you want or you can come and embrace Jesus. And if you need him, if you want him, I want you to know that you wouldn't be able to even consider coming to this altar unless he called you. And he's calling you. He loves you, friend. Do you think that God that created heaven and earth, that just for our entertainment, put stars in the sky, has bad intentions for you? The God that controls the temperature of the planet by such a minute ability, do you think he really doesn't have the best intentions for you? Do he thinks he wants to give you a horrible life? No, he sent his only begotten son, God in the flesh, God incarnate, came to touch lepers like us, whom the world said cannot be touched. You don't have to have the reputation. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. I can't do anything, but I can stand by the door and say, open the knob, let him in. If you're in this room and you sense that tug at your heart, I want you to come quickly. I'm going to pause about 20 more seconds. Say this prayer from your heart and understand it's not the, so much the prayer that saves, it's you coming. When you moved from your seat, God saw it. The Bible says heaven takes note of this moment. He sees you standing here right now that you moved. He says, come to me, and I'll by no means cast you out. But what the prayer does is it causes the mind, the soul, to understand what it is the Lord's doing and what you were doing. And it seals something in you. Say, dear Heavenly Father, I give my life to you. I believe with all my heart 
Jesus Christ died for me. He loves me. He shed his blood for me. So I could be forgiven. So I could be cleansed. So he could touch me. And I could touch him. So I could be his. And he could be mine. Come into my heart, Jesus. Save me. Heal me. Forgive me. I thank you for loving me. I renounce this world. I renounce my past. All sin. Everything. I laid at your feet. And I want you. I need you. I need your mercy. I need your love. In Jesus' name. Pray for each one. Stretch your hands forth and just believe for these people. Because if we haven't been here, we will be. We know we have to come. We need him. Lord, bless each one of these people. Touch them by the power of your Holy Spirit. Let your presence, your love envelop them, Lord. Let them sense it. Even in the hardest parts of their being, in the most lost parts of themselves, Lord, let them sense it. Let them know you were there, God, loving them, caring for them, adoring them, God, that you're for them and not against them. Lord, let them know, God, they're not alone. They're not alone. Even when they feel it, Lord, they're not alone. Surround them in your presence, Lord. Lead them, guide them. May nothing get in the way of them sensing your love. May you keep them on your path. May they experience the deepest parts of the goodness of God. I plead and I apply the blood of Christ over them. Protect them, Lord. Let them never be frustrated as they walk this out with you. Let them never listen to the voice of the wicked one. Lead them not into temptation. Deliver them from evil. Let them cling to you, and I pray you'd reveal yourself to them. Show yourself to them, Lord. In Jesus' name. I'm going to just instruct you a few things. Number one, be in the Word every day. If you don't have one, get, get the Bible. Love it. Accept all parts of it, even the parts you don't understand. Just keep reading it. It's, it's, it's word. It's, it's power. It's, it's eternal. When we have a baptism, be water baptized. Let that be a public declaration of your love for Jesus and his love for you. Tell somebody that's not in this room today the decision you've made. The Bible says if you're ashamed of Jesus, he'll be ashamed of you in heaven. Don't be ashamed. The more you Exhibit your love for him, the more he shows up for you. You know, the Bible talks about Stephen being the first one who was killed in the Bible for his faith. And it says he looked up and saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Nowhere else in Scripture does it talk about Jesus standing up. And he was standing up because Stephen was not ashamed of him. He made a stand for him, and he'll stand for you. Tell somebody about Jesus. It, 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 it causes the things of Christ in you to take deep root. Stay in fellowship. We would love for you to come here and be a part of it every week. But if not, one that preaches the word, that really wants to press into Jesus, that loves Jesus, that makes it all about Jesus, that it's just about Jesus, Jesus, and more Jesus. As we get ready to take communion, I'm going to ask you guys to get it first. What God has called clean, let no man, not even yourself, call common. I know there's going to be times I've been where you are. Listen, you've got the... The worst of the situations, I am a chief of sinners. The Lord has cleansed me of a lot. I know what it feels like. I sympathize with the, the turmoil of the soul and the life. When God cleanses you and gets you walking in his light, friend, there is nothing to compare. Father, help us now as we get ready to take communion. Our place would be a cleansing moment. And that the declaration of you are cleansed would permeate every heart and life when we would never be the same, ever. Ever, Lord, ever. Cleanse our motives. Cleanse our intentions. Restore innocence. The innocence, Lord, we lost when we were born, not because of the things we did, because we always need the purity of your spirit. In Jesus' name, if you get the elements and go back to your seat and we'll take together, let's just trust God. You pray, and I believe the Lord's going to do an amazing thing in your life today if you'll let him.